Peace be upon you. So God willing, in this episode, I want to address a documentary that's been circulating around entitled The Sacred City of Mecca, Have We Got It Wrong? In this documentary, it follows the work of Dan Gibson. Dan Gibson is an author, and his big claim to fame is that everyone has it wrong, that the Kaaba is actually located in Petra, in modern-day Jordan, and not in Mecca of Saudi Arabia. And all these billions of people who each year travel to go perform Hajj, they're going to the wrong location. <laughs> now, these are big claims, and a lot of people have been gravitating towards this is a recent update he made to the documentary. The original one, I think, was filmed a couple years ago, and this latest one has over a million views. And uh, for years, he's been making this uh, lectures and people have kind of given him attention. And it's predominantly come from two groups. One is the staunch Christian fundamentalists who want to eradicate Islam. They want to eradicate any teachings of the Quran. And they think by chiseling away at these foundational uh, aspects of the, uh, the, the, the belief that they can steer people away from it by instilling doubt into their hearts. And the second group is these Muslim sects who believe that Hajj was abolished after the, the Prophet, and therefore they have no uh, dog in the fight, and they think that, hey, it's Petra, it's Mecca, it doesn't matter. And um, these are the two groups that have been predominantly uh, connecting with this argumentation. And his claims comes predominantly from two sources. The first one is a number of these hadith that claim that the sacred city uh, where the Kaaba was located, according to the hadith, was thriving in agriculture. It had trees and fruits and streams and valleys and grass. And anyone knows that if you go to Mecca, it's a desert land. So he says, because of this contradiction, this could not be Mecca and Petra meets this criteria. And his second argumentation is that if you look at the location of the Qibla, of a lot of these early mosques built after the Prophet, that they point towards Petra and they do not point towards Mecca. And so God willing, in this episode, I want to deconstruct each one of these arguments and hopefully put this to rest. Because every couple of years this comes out, I get a bunch of uh, emails and questions and people linking to the video. And uh, rather than addressing this one by one, I'm hoping to just go piece by piece through each one of these arguments and hopefully, God willing, uh, not have to address this again. So we know that the best hadith, the best history is that of the Quran, that these are the, the words of God given to mankind for us to find salvation. So if someone provides us with information that contradicts the Quran, it's our duty to uh, uh, disregard that information and follow the Quran alone. Now the Quran two times mentions Mecca by name. Once using the modern day name of Mecca, spelled with a meme in Arabic or an M in English, and once using the ancient name of Becca, spelled with a B in English or a B in Arabic. And in 395 and 96, it reads, say, God has proclaimed the truth. You shall follow Abraham's religion, monotheism. He never was an idolater. The most important shrine established for the people is the one in Becca, a blessed beacon for all the people. Now, Dan Gibson claims that this word Becca, what it means, it means to weep, to cry, to mourn. And uh, he says that this could be an alternative name for Petra because in 362 AD, there was a massive earthquake that hit Petra and therefore people were crying and mourning about this. So maybe this word is in reference to Petra. Now, that's fine. Let's look at 4824. 4824 reads, he is the one who withheld their hands of aggression against you and withheld your hands of aggression against them in the valley of Mecca after he had granted you victory over them. God is seer of everything you do. So now we have a clear verse in the Quran that uses the word Mecca. It does not use Becca. Now Dan Gibson claims that, oh, well, maybe this was a mistranscription or a cover-up and that the original text spelt it with Becca and not Mecca. Now I went through about a dozen, actually, yeah, 12 uh, ancient manuscripts of the Quran dating between 700 and 900 AD. And every single one of these show that it's Mecca with an M, a meme, and not Becca. Unless these have been <laughs> severely tampered and they were able to get to everyone, it seems like a far-fetched claim to say that the Quran was mistranscribed here. Um, this is one of the things that should just be a showstopper to start that, look, the Quran cites Mecca, so therefore we accept that the Kaaba is in Mecca. Now, his other claim is that he says that Becca means mourning. It means to weep, to cry. And this is actually quite comical because this is a known mistake in translation. The word Becca comes from the root beam cough cough, and it means crowding together of people, lacking water, breaking of the neck. 
And um, the reason that they say it means this is that obviously in Mecca, people crowd together. They come to pilgrimage from all over. Uh, it's lacking of water. It's a desert. And the breaking of the neck, they attribute to the fact that anyone who's tried to invade Mecca, God has protected the, uh, the Kaaba. And we see this in the uh, surah about the elephant and that this is God's home and God protects it. So where did this concept that Becca means weeping? So how did we get to the idea that Becca means weeping? It means to cry. Well, years ago when they were originally translating the, uh, the uh, Old Testament from Hebrew to Greek, in Psalms 84, it talks about the valley of Becca. It says, How lovely is your dwelling place, Lord Almighty. My soul yearns, even faints, for the courts of the Lord. My heart and my flesh cry out for the living God. Even the sparrow has found a home and a swallow a nest for herself, where she may have her young a place near your altar. Lord Almighty, my King and my God, blessed are those who dwell in your house. They are ever praising you. Blessed are those whose strength is in you, whose hearts are set on pilgrimage as they pass through the valley of Becca. So when the early uh, scholars were translating this text, the word Becca sounds very similar to another Hebrew word, which is Becca, which means to weep. And early translations translated this as the valley of weeping. And some people who were looking at the old Greek text, they translated as that. But today, everyone understands that this is a name, the valley of Becca, and does not mean weeping, that this is a fundamentally different word. But it doesn't seem like Dan realized this and is using this word that is mistranslated. So it's not known as the valley of weeping. So you may be thinking, Greek, Hebrew, what does this have to do with the verses of the Quran? The Quran's written in Arabic. It's not written in Hebrew or in Greek. But this same phenomenon that we see in Hebrew, where two words, they sound almost identical, except one means Becca as in the ancient name of Mecca, and the other one means to weep or cry. The same phenomenon occurs in Arabic. The root of Becca in Arabic is Bekaf Kaf. We already went over this. And there's a similar sounding word called, which is Becca, which means to weep or to cry. But the root, the spelling of this is fundamentally different. This root is Beka Ya. And people make the mistake where they think that Becca comes from this root, this other root. And this is a known error that people have made. And it's interesting that this corresponds both in Hebrew and in Arabic. But it's worth pointing out that these are two fundamentally different words, despite almost sounding identical. So just to recap, in order for Dan Gibson's claims to be true, several things have to play out. One is we need to prove that Petra was also known as the Valley of Weeping. Secondly, the Quran would have to be shown that it was tampered with, that it's not actually the Valley of Be uh, Mecca in 4824, that it's the Valley of Becca. And thirdly, that Psalm 84 would have to be changed from Becca, which is a name, to Beke, which is the action of crying or weeping. So all these things have to be true for this one claim to hold water. Now, this just shows the level of straws that are being grasped to make this theory come true. So God willing, let's look at the next argument he makes to why Mecca could not possibly be the location of the Kaaba and that it better corresponds with uh, Petra. So a number of times in the Quran, it references the city where the uh, Kaaba is located, where Prophet Muhammad went um, as uh, Umm al ghura which translates to the mother of cities. But if you look archaeologically at Mecca, there are no thriving <laughs> buildings, walls, structures, ruins, uh, anything of that sort. He even claims that if you go to the ancient maps, you'll never even see Mecca mentioned on a map. So how could this place be the mother of cities? Now, this particular argument is quite comical to me because these individuals, they're looking at this verse, this ayat, in one single isolation at that time, at that place. They're saying, how could God call this desert, this desolate land, the most important community, the mother of the cities, Umala Kura. How could this be? But they don't understand is that God is not looking at one data point. God doesn't see just what happens today. He sees all the way into the future. He sees how all these things transpire. And here's an awesome example of this. The name Abraham, it means Ab is in Hebrew, a father of Haman, multitude. God called this individual Abraham the father of multitude, despite the fact that his wife was barren. He did not have a child until the age of 86. 
And God told him in Genesis 22, 17, says, I will surely bless you and make your descendants as numerous as the stars in the sky, as the sand on the seashore. If someone saw this in a cross section, they met Abraham when he's well into his 60s and 70s and said, you, you're called the father of multitude. You can't even have a child. How could this possibly be you? You'd realize they would disbelieve. But this is the genius of God. God is not limited to time and space. God is seeing the potential that's there. Today, during Hajj, over 10 million people converged to this tiny town of Mecca to perform Hajj. In 22:27, it says, And proclaim that the people shall observe Hajj pilgrimage. They will come to you walking or riding on various exhausted means of transportation. They will come from the farthest locations. God is making this declaration in the Quran. Because when God speaks these things, they become true. Another example of this is in the uh, story of uh, Joseph. We know that Joseph was left for dead in a well by his brothers. He was sold into slavery. And this is what God says in Surah 12, verse 21. It says, The one who bought him in Egypt said to his wife, Take good care of him. Maybe he can help us, or maybe we can adopt him. And it says, we thus establish Joseph on earth. This word established in uh, Arabic is makana, which means to be strong, have power, hold high rank or authority, be influential, grant an honorable position, establish, grant authority to someone who just got sold into slavery. Now, if you stop the story there, you'd be, I don't get it. How could someone be in a place of authority when they're sold into slavery? But what they don't understand is that isn't the end of Joseph's story. If we continue on, we see that after that, he also gets thrown into prison. But from there, he becomes the prime minister of Egypt. He becomes the highest ranking children of Israel of all of Egypt. He becomes Pharaoh's right-hand man, the Ben Bernanke, Jerome Powell, whatever you want, of his time. That's amazing. And it's the same thing when God is calling Mecca the uh, mother of all cities, Umm al -Kura. He's saying this is the potential that's within this. These millions of people who converge on this land. Again, to think back then when this is told, that seems ludicrous. That seems crazy. How could this be? This is this desert. You know, it's not this thriving economy. But this is the way God talks about his creations. He sees the potential. So let's look at another one of these claims that Dan makes towards his uh, argument. So Dan Gibson, he relies on numerous hadith from the prophet. But he even relies on the Hadith of the father of the Prophet. Now, if we know that the Hadith of the Prophet themselves are unreliable, how reliable are the Hadith of his father? This is just absolutely comical, but he claims from these Hadith that the town where the sacred house is located was a lush valley, that it's described as having trees and grass and fruits and grapes and fields and streams. But this is completely contradictory to the Quran. And it's interesting because in the documentary, he even admits there's no cultivatable land in Mecca. Therefore, he says this must be describing Petra. Now, how does God describe the location of the sacred house? In 1437, we hear that uh, this is what Abraham says. It says, our Lord, I have settled part of my family in this plantless valley at your sacred house. Abraham is describing the location of the sacred house as a plantless valley. And if you look at the Arabic, it's biwaidin ghayri di zarin, which translates to in a valley not with cultivation, no plants. Now, does this describe Petra, which Dan is saying is thriving, there's trees, there's valleys, there's streams, uh, there's uh, lush orchards, or does this describe Mecca, which again is a desert? In its own word, he admits, again, there's no cultivatable land in Mecca, which corresponds with what is in the Quran. So another false claim that Dan makes is that he says that Mecca was known as a thriving trading hub where people from all over would come to trade and do commerce, and we have no archaeological record of this. And that's the reason because it's not true. Uh, historians know that during the time, the tribesmen of the Quraysh were not traders. Instead, they were entrusted with religious services from which they significantly profited. They would tax the pilgrims who had come to Hajj. This was their business. We know that Prophet Muhammad, he was a uh, merchant. Historically, this is what's known. But the fact of saying that the people of the Quraysh were traders, that they had uh, this trade hub, that there's no evidence of that in the Quran. The only thing we know is that they were the custodians, so they thought, of the sacred shrine. In 4825, it reads, 
it is they who disbelieved and barred you from the sacred masjid and even prevented your offerings from reaching their destination. So this shows that the people, the Quraysh tribe that was responsible, who had the stronghold over the sacred sanctuary, how they were exhorting their powers. In 833, it reads, however, God is not to punish them while you are in their midst. So it's talking about the prophet. God is not to punish them, which is the Quraysh, while they are seeking forgiveness. Had they not deserved God's retribution by repelling others from the sacred masjid, even though they are not the custodians thereof, the true custodians thereof are the righteous, but most of them do not know. Their salat at the shrine, the Kaaba, were no more than a mockery and a means of repelling the people by crowding them out. Therefore, suffered a retribution for your disbelief. This is what the people, the Quraysh, the individuals who had the stronghold on Mecca were doing. We have no historical account according to the Quran of them being rampant in trade and spices and this and that. This is something that comes from Hadith. Uh, there isn't any backing that supports this in the Quran, which again confirms that all that was there was God's sacred house. Um, to say that it was a, this uh, thriving economy with lots of trade and agriculture and this and that is a farce. There is no truth about that. So far, every argument we've looked at, we've been able to deconstruct and show that these contradict the verses of God in the Quran, something that we hold to be the absolute truth, the best history. The last argument that Dan Gibson holds on to uh, is that he claims that the early mosques, their direction of Ghibla all point towards Petra and not towards Mecca. And because of this, he claims that this is the reason that we know that Petra is the true location of the sacred sanctuary and not Mecca. Now, there's so much to deconstruct in this argument. The first is that the oldest mosque we know in existence still today is known as Masjid al Qabilatin, which means the mosque of the two Qiblas. And this is the location in Medina where it's believed that Prophet Muhammad got the revelation to change the direction of the Qibla before it was restored back to Mecca. And for that moment, he changed the direction of Ghibla towards Jerusalem. And it was meant to be a test. And we read in Surah 2, verse 142, it reads, The fools among the people would say, Why did they change the direction of their Ghibla? Say, To God belongs the east and the west. He guides whoever wills in a straight path. We thus made you an impartial community that you may serve as witnesses among the people and the messenger serve as a witness among you. We changed the direction of your original Qibla only to distinguish those among you who will readily follow the messenger from those who had turned back on their heels. It was a difficult test, but not for those who are guided by God. God never puts your worship practices to waste. God is compassionate towards the people, most merciful. We have seen you turning your face about the sky, searching for the right direction. We now assign a Qibla that is pleasing to you. Henceforth, you shall turn your face towards the sacred masjid, wherever you may be. All of you shall turn your faces towards it. Those who receive the previous scripture know that this is the truth from their Lord. God is never unaware of anything they do. So we see from these verses that there was a time when they were all praying in one direction, and then Prophet Muhammad got a revelation to change the direction of Qibla, and then it was restored back to its original location. So what took place here? It's fascinating that the masjid of two Qiblas as the name insinuates, uh, it has two Qiblas because it's known that this is the masjid that Prophet Muhammad was residing in when he got the commandment to change the direction of Qibla. And you know where these two Qiblas point? To Jerusalem and to Mecca. They do not point towards Petra. So what can we say about these other mosques that Dan claims are pointing towards Qiblas that are more aligned towards Petra than they are towards Mecca? In 2017, there was a critique written about Dan's claims. And it cites David A. King, who's an expert in the direction of distance to Mecca and studying of the Qibla. King argued that early Muslim Arabs were unable to precisely establish Qiblas when building new mosques until later mathematical developments made precision possible. And keep in mind, the Qiblas that Dan Gibson is citing, these are located hundreds, if not thousands of miles away from Mecca. And it continues, furthermore, King wrote, many variations in orientation are better accounted for by regional and local practices, imperfect geography, and folk astronomy. King noted Gibson's inadequate grasp of mathematics uh, as inexplicable. King summarized his analysis of Gibson's work as an amateurish, non-scholarly document that is both offensive to Muslims and also an insult to Muslim and Western scholarship. So here's someone who's an expert who's saying, look, Trying to determine the direction of Qibla from these ruins is an inaccurate method. Even then, the technology that was available for those individuals at that time 
is by no means accurate to say that they were able to pinpoint exactly the direction that they were facing today. I mean, today I walk into a masjid and still people aren't praying in the exact direction towards the uh, the Kaaba. It's off by, you know, degrees here and there. What are we to expect of people of the past? You know, do they have nearly the technology we have today? So again, we're seeing that all this evidence that Dan Gibson is holding up is truth. Nothing of it holds up. So far, all we've done is refuted the arguments that Dan Gibson has made in his documentary. But what we, we've yet to do, and for years Dan Gibson has been challenged with this, is how do you account for all the other geographical necessities for such a claim to claim that Muhammad was actually in Petra and not in Mecca? And I'll give you just some basic ones. For one, we know for a fact, historically and in the Quran, that the Quraysh were the tribe that were responsible for Mecca. They were the tribe that resided in Mecca. God dedicates a whole surah addressing the Quraysh. Now, if Mecca had no relevancy to Muhammad or the sacred sanctuary, why are they being addressed? What's the purpose of talking about this, this Bedouin <laughs> tribe? What's the significance there? Or the Battle of Bedr? Or uh, Medina, or what's referenced in the Quran is Yathrib, uh, which is the ancient name of Medina. You know, these locations, they're over 800 miles away from Petra. Why is God referencing these cities in the, the context of the Prophet's life if they hold no relevancy? For years, Dan Gibson has been posed with these questions and has yet to be able to provide answers. And the reason is because foundationally, it's impossible. How do you account for all this? How do you make sense of all this? The only way you can accept Dan Gibson's assertions that the Prophet Muhammad lived in um, Petra and that the Kaaba resides in Petra and not in Mecca of Saudi Arabia is if you abandon the Quran outright. And this is what it comes down to. Someone who has disbelief in their heart, they're looking for reason to renounce a religion, the devil has just provided you that answer. But someone who believes that this Quran is the word of God, there's nothing that's going to shake us. If someone provides us information that contradicts the Quran and we accept that information, it shows who our God is. In Surah 6 verse 121, it reads, The devils inspired their allies to argue with you. If you obey them, you will be idol worshippers. Individuals who claim to follow the Quran, yet abide by what Dan Gibson is saying, are either doing it out of ignorance or are showing the disbelief they have in their heart. Now I know there's nothing I can say to convince someone if they believe that the Qibla should be now pointing towards Petra and not Mecca. But I want to read the following verses from Surah 2, starting from 145 to 149, the remaining verses about the change in the Ghibla. It reads, Even if you show the followers of the scripture every kind of miracle, they will not follow your Ghibla, nor shall you follow their Ghibla. They do not even follow each other's Ghibla. If you acquiesce to their wishes after the knowledge has come to you, you will belong with the transgressors. Those who receive the scripture recognize the truth here as they recognize their own children. Yet some of them conceal the truth knowingly. This is the truth from your Lord. Do not harbor any doubt. Each of you chooses the direction to follow. You shall race towards righteousness wherever you may be. God will summon you all. God is omnipotent. Wherever you go, you shall turn your face during Salat towards the sacred masjid. This is the truth from your Lord. God is never unaware of anything you all do. God willing, this talk was beneficial for you. And I want to end with one verse, 1781. It says, Proclaim the truth has prevailed and falsehood has vanished. Falsehood will inevitably vanish. If you guys got comments or questions, please hit us up at crontalk at gmail.com. And until next time, peace and God bless.